What's going on, everyone? Today is a build video, a real-time build video, step-for-step -step on how to build your very own black triangle overdrive. And this overdrive is a Vemram Janray circuit, but my little tweaks on things is not with the circuit itself, but to make it more accessible, make all the options more accessible. So like, for example, the clipping section was normally a internal dip switch. The saturation required a tiny screwdriver, and I didn't like those two things. So I externalized them and made it super simple for anyone to find the tone that they're looking for. Coincidentally, this is actually my favorite overdrive. Don't tell any of my other pedals, but this was my favorite overdrive. And I am so incredibly proud to offer this um, circuit board available for anyone who wants to build one. Now, um, everything that you see here during my build video, such as like the PCB holder, the solder I'm using, um, I have a suggested soldering iron station for everyone, uh, is in the description below. So if you get lost, the build docs are available on my site at www.thetonegeek.com. Here is the Mauser. So I'm gonna be going through this build using the Mauser. Bomb. You can go ahead and order from other places, of course, and substitute if you're crafty with that sort of things. But since they're basically on my bomb, you'll notice that there's uh, basically like the enclosure, the drilling that they will do for you, which makes this super awesome, super precise. I love it. Um, their powder coating is top notch. In this build, I'm going to be using their black sand texture which is real sharp it feels great no fingerprints on there um very cool stuff and it works really well with the black i don't think it disrupts too much which is great um the other thing is you know, like switches and things you can you can choose your own preference and style there's black ones available on love my switches which is really cool but um i think i'm going to go with the standard switches on this the chrome ones and these chrome stomp box so or the stomp switch so i'm going to kind of go over everything um to start my soldering iron i'm using this awesome and if they make it in qu smaller quantities i bought this one pound and it was like 110 bucks but this cordis audio quad eutectic set solder really sucks up and sounds great of course um it's low temp lowish temp I, today my iron is set at 675 degrees, um, and that is a little higher than I would normally use, and that's because this is a four-layer circuit board. If you look, you do not see any traces on the back, and you do not see any traces on the top. That's because the basically there's a four layers, and all the signal routing is on the internal layers, which is kind of cool. So the top is... 100% copper, the bottom is 100% copper, and if you remember anything in schooling, copper is a great heat sink. So that heat sink will make the heat transfer um, very efficient, which means that the solder will get uh, colder, the soldering iron will lower the temperature pretty quickly. Where that does make a difference, and I'll kind of go over this, is the grounds need to, you kind of hold the solder there a little bit longer, soldering iron a little bit longer than you normally would on the non-ground connections. So with that out of the way, let's get going on this build. My management is reminding me to tell you that this is a great first time builder uh, build for someone. It's, it's not too complicated. The parts are not very expensive. So that is that. What I like to do, starting off, and if I can find one, is I like to start off with things that are low to the bottom of that circuit board. So you see these diodes are going to be low, um, like physically low, the and resistors, not really the capacitors because they kind of stand up. So today I'm starting off with some 1N4148s. There's five of them, and there's also this other diode, the 1N5157. Now I'm just going to kind of pop these off to the side here, behind here. Um, and the difference is you can use the 5157, and I'll tell you this is a kind of a tweak, up here in D1. I labeled it D1 because the original Vamram 
Jan Ray, if you're going for original, uses the, the 4148 here. And the 515748, uh, five, 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 well, shoot, what the heck is it? But anyway, the other one, let's see if I can find it quick. Yeah, 5817, this has a lower forward voltage. And what that's going to do, this is basically a reverse polarity protection diode. That lower full forward voltage is going to give the chip a little bit more headroom over here. And it's not going to be 100%, um, I guess, in theory, like the original Jan Ray. Uh, it's going to give you a slight, slight, see, I mean, like, I don't know, 0.3 volts difference in overhead <laughs> or headroom, sorry. So, um, you know what? I'm going to go a little crazy. Let's, let's, like Bob Ross, let's, let's get, let's get a little silly with it. And he does his paintings. That's what I'm going to start with here. Going to give this thing a little extra headroom. Again, that only is really seen or heard, if you even hear anything at all. At when the, the gain and the level are maxed out, that's where you get that tiny bit more headroom. Because um, basically you're giving the op amp a little bit more voltage before it starts to clip. So there is our first install right there. I'm going to go through and install all the other diodes. Because it just seems to be easier when you install the diodes all at the same time. All right, so in the on the back here, I'm kind of pulling them off to the side. You can see, like that. And you can fast forward on YouTube. So if at any point you're bored, or you want to skip to a certain section, um, definitely fast forward or watch this video at two times real time, um, whatever your preference is. It's kind of a cool feature. Make sure the black side of these diodes are facing the black, that little band, as they say. It is starting to become winter or fall up here, so my hands are extremely dry. I hope it's not too gross. You can substitute these. Basically, these are just standard diodes. There's nothing too crazy about them. The 4148s, otherwise known as the 914s. You can swap them out with like new old stock 1S5158s. Or, sorry, 1S, the, the, the ones that are in the Tube Screamer. 1S. Here, you can substitute those with 1S1588. These are new old stock Toshibas. These went into the Tube Screamers back in the day. They have basically the same forward voltage characteristics um, as these 914s. They are often substituted in and out. Um, and when you're done with these bags, feel free to save them. I know I save them, and if you ever ordered a circuit board for me, a lot of times you might get them in one of these packages that I get from Mauser, just to save waste. I don't need to just throw them out if I can use them for other things. Um, so here's something interesting. Here we are. The next thing I grabbed is this military grade CMF55. That's the code for it. Basically the size, wattage, and everything else in the package. And it's what this looks like. It's 1.2K. You do not... Getting into crazy territory here. You don't need... This is metal film. You don't need the military grade. In the circuit, this the signal travels directly through this resistor. So in theory, if you have a high quality spec, which is this, it's military grade, going through that resistor and nothing else, 
uh, it will have a good sort of quality to it in the way that there's not a lot of noise, shot noise, all those sort of, what's it, Nyquist noise, whatever, um, going through it. Standard metal film, you can be fine. If you want to do right here something like Analog Man's King of Tone, he would put a carbon composition resistor in this spot. And that's what that's where sort of the mojo, I guess, if you will. You can go with clean and quiet, or you can do analog man mojo and put a carbon composition in there. Alright, so my next resistor is a 7.5K. And that is one of them. It's nice that if you order my project, it's very, very, very easy that you can see how many of the quantity to go with. So you're not scrambling. It's not that big of complicated of a circuit board. Um, because I have other projects that are a lot more components. And you can get lost pretty easily. What I like to do... And this is just a me thing, but I've seen others implement something similar. I like to have the bands all face the same way. So if you look, there's purple, green, black. This is the resistor band, right? And on the very end is this brown. So on mainly on metal film resistors, you see a brown, which means it's one percent tolerance. I like to have them all for facing the right, and when they're vertically mounted, I like to have them all on the top. It just makes it for a cleaner look, in my opinion. Um, it has zero effect on tone, but it just looks cleaner. All right, next up is a 100 ohms. This is half watt. This is in the power supply section. And basically, it smooths out any sort of ripples and stuff and creates a low, low, low frequency... Um, like basically it prevents low frequencies uh, in the power supply or just erroneous things from entering in the circuit creating some noise and unpleasant things and this 100 ohm resistor does have voltage dropping through it it doesn't need to be half watt i think that's just the kind of like an over engineering thing that was done on the original vemram circuit so i stayed true to that, and I think a lot of people are, are really appreciating with these circuit boards that I'm building. They're more remaining true to the original in design and intentions um, than some of the aftermarket ones. PC, uh, not I mean, pedal PCB is awesome. Aeon are awesome. They do their thing, but they don't really take in consideration the original. Um, sort of component selection as an option. So here's 91K, 9.1K. We are going to add that here. Unfortunately, it's like a blue. It doesn't look exactly like the lighter blue. I like the lighter blue Koas, personally. Um, they look like they are have a little bit of a, well, they do have a little bit thicker of a lead and the way they're welded on to that resistive element. All right, there's one 9.1K. I don't know if I have another. Oh, there it is. Of course there is. This is the... for the secondary voltage. I think the 4.5 volts for the op amp. So there we go. Again, I'm going to keep this bag for other things so I'm not polluting or killing turtles. My daughter is convinced that every straw that goes in the waste bin goes in a turtle's mouth. It's definitely a fear tactic. All right, so next we have 680 ohms. A bag inside of a bag. So sometimes Mauser gets a little crazy when they are packing these things. cut reel. So that means that there's little ends to them. Okay. 680. Nice thick leads. Very beautiful. 
resistors. Again, I'm just pulling them to the side. If you want to do like Boss does, Boss will push pinch them inwards and then kind of cut flush. Um, it is important to have sharp um, side cutters, you know, basically flush cut. And I will put my preferred ones in the description below. All right, next. What do we got? One mag. Now, I ordered two projects with my Mauser order, so there's not actually five needed here. I think it's just one. Um, so don't be confused. Pretty please. And that resistor goes over here. And also, by the way, you can mute your speakers if you don't like this background noise. Um, all right, let's keep digging into my box of parts. Where are more resistors? Please and thank you. 6.8K. So this 6.8K is what I'm going to use for LEDR. LEDR is a, can be a few options. If you're using my uh, bomb I, in the white diode, I like the 6.8. 6.8 is basically controls the dim, how dim or how bright this resist, um, sorry, the LED is. If you want to, if you have like a really bright LED and you prefer like a dimmer LED, I suggest going up to like 33K, which is pretty high in this LEDR, and see if that's too dim or if that's on the right track or maybe that's just right. Because I've had diodes or LEDs right around 6. Point, um, or sorry, 33K that <laughs> actually were really bright at first, and then at 33K, they were perfect. So, I recommend that. All right, next is... What is this? 3.3K. And I think we're done with our resistors after this. Of course, there is a bubble wrap in here. It's not really necessary, but... It really seems kind of like every component has their own sort of packaging technique. I use these padded ones for my um, circuit boards. They're pre-populated with surface mount technology, SMT or SMD for some. So again, I'm going to put all of the color bands facing the same way. Resistors do not have polarity, meaning there's no positive and negative side to a resistor. Some jokesters on the internet will tell you that there is, and it's usually around April 1st. Or more specifically, on April 1st. And then they'll also try to convince you that's where the mojo is on April 1st. So on April 1st, I'm going to tell you that resistors <laughs> have polarity and all my circuit boards are designed in a way that polarity matters. All right, I did just make a mistake. So before we solder, this 3.3K is not one meg. I don't know how that happened. I think I was just rushing. So I'm going to put that right where it belongs. Come on. And then I found that one meg. Again, I have multiple things on order, so my quantity is a little different. And now 
install a one mag exactly where a one mag should be. I don't know, there's something elegant about just the hue of this blue. It's not bright blue. I don't know, it just looks more elegant, I guess, compared to like this bright blue up here. It's kind of like a muted blue, kind of like a gray, gray blue. It's very nice. All right. Um, all right. Uh, I, at this point, when I got all the resistors and, and just these diodes made the cut, to make sure everything's kind of secure, you don't have to go, you know, um, full 90 degrees or, or folding it straight down, because um, then it'll be hard to kind of clip those, and, and you run the risk of um, cutting into your circuit board. So I like to go like this kind of an angle. It's just right for holding in these leads. You can see they're all nice and flat, and I got the soldering iron going. Please excuse the mess on my bench, but normally I'm running this fume extractor. It's very cool. I'll put a link in the description. It's got a filter, that um, carbon filter in here, so it exhausts uh, in this room. It's a small room, um, directly out the back and captures my fumes. Uh, for the camera's sake, I am not going to turn it on this time, but just, you know, for future reference or just in case you're worried about my own health, um, I do use a fume extractor. All right, let's get back to it. Another thing I'm gonna recommend is getting one of these really cool, and I have it in the description, um, silicon mats, because when an advantage of having these components nice and low on this silicon surface um, is that we can put this down and not have to worry about resistors, you know, kind of their leads popping up. So I'm going to actually take it out of the PCB holder. And again, I highly recommend this um, mat because it's got these little compartments. There is, like over here, those compartments right up there um, are magnetized. So if you have any screws or anything, you can kind of put them in there. It's really nice. And I got some screws, or uh, some screwdrivers, some other bits, and those compartments. So it's really cool. It's a new thing I'm using now is a silicon mat. And plus, it's electrically neutral. Or it doesn't or inert or whatever you want to use to say that it doesn't con conduct electricity. So again, I have my soldering iron at 675 degrees um, and I'm using my Cordis Audio Quadutectic Silver Premium blah 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 core solder this description or the uh, link is in the description. So remember that this is a four layer circuit board so you want to leave it on just a little bit more if you've done other circuit boards than, than those. Just because the heat extraction, uh, or uh, basically the heat sink of the circuit board and those copper layers, super easy. So here is a ground lug. And you can sort of tell because if you look really close at the trace, you're going to see like a little um, star pattern. And you want to hold that a little bit longer on that one. Don't be worried about frying your components. They're pretty robust um, and built for standing heat for a certain amount of time. But if you don't, you'll get a cold solder joint, which could make noise or just your pedal may not work at all. So you can see I'm kind of, it's not really rapid fire, but I'm making a way around with this camera in my face. It makes it a little difficult, more than it should. If, um, but I'm doing it for you guys. So I will take the hit for now. You can see like these resistors do roll a little bit when they're on the mat. So I like to do one leg 
if it starts rolling like this, I'll do one row of legs. And then we can sort of get away with adjusting if we need to on the other side. So the silicon mat is the same sort of silicon that they use for like those oven mitts that you might see at Kohl's or other stores. So they definitely can withstand the heat of that's being transferred to the resistor. You can see the solder sort of being sucked in. So right now I'm just going to do a little health check. It looks like everything's pretty aligned, staying in place. I'm happy with that. These extra diodes, I'll move them. So don't be afraid to kind of go back and, and touch up something. And then if you have like a little blob at the end, draw your soldering iron up the leg. And you can clean that joint out. Like I had a little bit too much. It's probably going to be hard to see on this camera. I had a little bit too much solder balled up at the very bottom of that. And I was able to clean it up by just drawing the solder up the leg. Pardon my hand in here. I just want to be able to solder this the right way. So now, if there's any leads in the way for the next row, I'm going to kind of carefully... Let's do one more inspection. So every single one side of the legs, there's one that's a little bit out of alignment, but I'll let it pass. You can see that I did a good job with this one, um, that the solder did come through on that ground lug. I believe that's a ground on that one. Oh, uh, yeah, let's put it, you can just give it a little bit more heat and then it will sometimes just pop right through. Or, here's another trick. You can put your soldering iron on the top and it will also draw some of that solder through. Not a lot, and then you can just kind of work your way up that leg. And now, you can see here that that solder goes directly through the hole, making a fantastic mechanical connection. And on the other side, you can see, I mean, by NASA standards and aerospace standards, that's too much solder that comes through. But for me, I like to see a little bit of solder coming up through um, to make that mechanical connection just like that. On the spaceships and things, everything is weighted. And, and predicted and calculated. So the soldering technicians have to work within a spec. And it is beyond something that I have patience for at this point. Maybe one day I'll become certified and that would be like a cool selling point to my pedals. But also, I don't really know if it's good for how much time consumed or time consuming it would be for every single microscopic um, check on all the connections are, are done under a microscope. Sorry, I'm just concentrating here and trying to be entertaining at the same time. It is the next day when I started this video, so it's not the same day. And we had a little fun last night, so I'm a little slow. I apologize. It looks like we got all the connections here. So next up, I'm just gonna clean my soldering tip. I like to use these brass tip cleaners. Main reason is um, it doesn't lower the heat. Like if you were to use a paper towel that's wet, which does work and how I done it for years before this, um, it just lowers your temperature of your soldering iron. And that's not good. So I have a bin below me that I throw these leads in, but since I'm trying to do this all on camera relatively quickly, um, I'm just pushing it to the side for now. I'm clipping pretty low, like almost as flush as I can to the board, um, but not obsessing over getting it as low as possible. You see here, like some of the leads go up on the where the pot is going to lay. So you definitely make sure you get the dust covers with your pot 
because your, the back of your pot could touch and short out these two leads. So that's why they make those little dust covers in addition to being, you know, sealed for the dust. You can get away when you see like a sequence of resistors or uh, so, oh, I forgot a solder joint here. With doing multiple at a time, that's fine. And you can obviously rip through these a lot quicker. I go at, like, basically everything I do is at a relatively moderate pace, so um, some people can just ch -ch -ch rip and cut these things. I'm not that type. I like to take my time. I'm not in a rush. Ooh, I think I forgot another solder joint there, which is fine. I can cut it at this point, um, as long as I come back. The advantage of cutting it like that, I guess, is that there's less heat transfer to the leg. There we go. And then the solder just kind of flows a little faster. Okay, I'm gonna put this back in the circuit board. If you have any legs, well, we'll use the um, capacitors actually, but if what we're looking for is a nice straight leg that's gonna be used later for our ground. So something a little long, but I think I'm just gonna wait until we get to the silver mica. Those are the best. Cause see how nice and thick they are. All right, so now I got this 22 picofarad and I am going to warn you right now. So keep that soldering iron near you. We are going to do this capacitor on its own because the leads are pretty thin. I mean, not like in a bad way, but you're gonna see in a second, we got some trickery. So if you do have one of these PCB holders, I highly recommend that you keep using it. And if you don't have one, I recommend that you do get it. Uh, with capacitors, there is a very small, I don't think it will focus, um, number on there. I like to have those facing up so we're going to just drop that into its hole. And you see it bottoms right out like that. Well, it's kind of hard to see that way. It just goes straight to the bottom. The only problem with that is these leads have their, their coating go down. Sorry, the coating, not the leads. The coating goes down the leads a bit. And you can actually not have a great solder connection. So what I like to do is lift it like that. Bend the leads underneath with my finger. So... When I flip it upside down, that thing is going to be suspended. So you see like the leads all the way up. And I'm going to drop it down. And one of these legs, and I, this is the one on the right, is a ground. So we're going to hold that for a bit. So the solder goes through the hole. The plating is a little bit thinner just because of how small that capacitor is. And this capacitor, by the way, if you use my Mauser bomb, see I'm holding it, holding it, holding it, heating it up. Then I put the solder on. Let's check out that joint if it went all the way through the hole. Now, see, it didn't even come up, which is fine because let's see if we can hold the heat here and draw it. No, not so lucky this time. But you can see that it does take quite a bit of heat. And you know what? Don't be ashamed. Just put some solder on the other side. One cool thing about the solder that I'm using is that it's soup. The flux is inert. Doesn't carry any sort of electrical properties. And I don't like how much extra is on there. So I'm going to clean my tip. Sounds kind of funny. And then just try to draw it off. Okay. So you might see me not clean the circuit board, and that's, uh, you know, some of the things I have to consider when making a bunch of these is, you know, where am I spending my time? Um, I, since you buy high-quality solder, and the flux is in this one, completely electrically uh, inert. I'm going to keep using that until someone corrects me on that usage. 
um, then I don't need to come back and clean it up with some flux cleaner. I do have flux cleaner and I recommend it. I use this mainly for um, when I'm repairing something, which is not very frequent. All right, oh, forgot the other leg. So the other leg shouldn't be as bad with holding the heat on. Or did I already do it? I must have already done it. All right, so that 22, yep, you can see like the solder has gone through. This still has a weird little leg thing to it, so there you go, it's a lot better. And plus I can kind of just push gently out of the way of that IC socket, which the IC socket is next. This is why I try to reuse the bags. This, it came in this bag, which came in this bag, and then contained this bag. So three layers of protection for this gold-plated, by the way, IC socket. So I like to choose the best that I can choose. So one, I guess, mistake I've made so far, especially by soldering in that other one, is if I did this IC before this, so if you haven't soldered anything yet, um, you could place, take this circuit board out of your holder and then just take this IC socket and place it directly on the ground and you can solder and hold that IC socket in place. But since we didn't do that, I'm going to insert the socket and then very carefully on the back, try to bend one of the pins over. So you see it's gold which is cool. So I'm going to go opposite corner. Just be very careful here and make sure that the IC is flush on the other side. So don't like completely bend it all the way, but just so it holds in place. And then we can burn our finger by holding it as well. But if you don't, at this point, you can see that it's being held up. You know, it's not gonna fall through. And if you don't wanna burn your finger, then go ahead, solder it just like this. But if you're like me and you wanna get it as tight as possible down to the circuit board, maybe, maybe we can sacrifice a finger or two. So I'm holding the circuit board up with my finger, bringing that solder in, and I'm not really burning my finger, so it's not that dangerous because I'm holding the opposite corner of that socket. So you can see that even with one leg in, it still can move up and around. Pay attention to what pin is ground. The gold helps draw that in as well. But you can see right here that this lower right hand one is ground. So I'm gonna hold it there just a little bit longer than the other ones before I put that solder in. So that seems pretty good. Ah, there it goes, it drew it, drew it right down. And at this point, everything's kind of being held together, held nice and tight. So I can just kind of go down the line, reaching around my camera So again, please don't judge my soldering skills and all the rest, my accuracy during videos because I have this camera directly in my line of sight. Oops, I don't need to take that off. All right, next up is, yeah, let's do these caps up here. So I'm a really big nerd into component selection. You see these caps are the same rating as the original caps used in the Vemoram, but this, or these are solid polymer or organic polymer capacitors. And you see here the ESR. So these capacitors are super, super basic, um, like as, as close or nearing as close as like a perfect capacitance as possible. Low ESR is so equivalent series resistance. So you want that number to be as low as possible for like a great performing capacitor. 
And plus an advantage of these capacitors is that they're meant for like basically high or to tolerate high heat environments. And if you don't use them at high heat, the spec, the basically the, the lifetime of these capacitors at a lower temperature lasts almost <laughs> basically you're going to replace this the stomp switch and a, pe a potentiometer or two in this pedal before you replace these caps so now if you ever see or hear people online talk about you know doing a cap job um mainly or, or recap they talk about and you want to do the long leg into the positive hole and that's a theme electronics the long leg is typically long one but so these capacitors are kind of newer to the scene. They've been around in computer circuit boards for a long time and used there in car electronics. And the main reason is that those electronics are, need to be high performing, especially in like high gigahertz range. So you need capacitors that are stable and pr are very predictable. Now, normally you see these sort of wet capacitors being used are the typical can electrolytics. Another thing that these capacitors will be good at is um, basically filtering out the low frequency noise from the power supply and other things and ripple. These are going to perf perform really well. I'm going to go ahead and clip them at this point. You're going to notice that I'm going to be soldering a lot more frequent than I did with the resistors. And at this point, I like to do that. I don't know why. I just like to do that at this point. All right, let me grab some of these. Actually, let's go with the silver micas next. So I don't, I didn't order from Mauser just because I have hundreds of these, obviously, on hand. But just so you know, the ones from Mauser I think are yellow. Some say that that means that it's ROHS compliant. Um, great. All right, so what are we gonna do here? I got 150 picofarad first. Let's go ahead and grab the 100 pico, 150 picofarad. I got these, and I'm gonna face the, the number. Upwards. I got these from AmplifiedParts.com, and I use them for my amp building stuff. So while I had one on order, or an order placed, I went ahead and bought these capacitors because they're significantly more uh, economical there than the ones from Mauser. Silver mica <clears throat> is expensive. Some people have no. That's tantalum. Um, I like to use these capacitors on bright caps too, on tube amplifiers. But these silver micas are cool because they're also colored black. Remember that we're going to steal these or, or reuse these legs because they're nice and thick and they're nice and long. So in theory, these should be nice and vertical. Yep, very, don't, don't, I mean, try not to correct them afterwards. And if you do have to, if it's really off, go ahead and just heat up and kind of lay your soldering iron across both if you can. And then try to heat up both legs at the same time to get that aligned. But mine are pretty dang good. All right, so now we're going to go find these capacitors. But before we find those capacitors, we are going to cut the leads off and keep one to the side. I think I'm going to keep this one. Throw away the rest. You don't need that junk on your, on your desk. All right, so first up, there's two one microfarad capacitors. These are box film capacitors. I chose, I think these are the gray ones, because I wanted to keep the colors down to a minimum. So we have a bag, 
with a bag. And now there are two box film capacitors in here. These are polyester film. These are actually the same exact brand that is used, at least on the Vemram Janray. Or sorry, not the Janray, the TSV 808 uses these exact brands. So I decided to stick with that brand for this. Because if I can get the original, and that's my sort of claim to this circuit board arena, if I can get the original, I'm going to go ahead and spec that out. All right, next, see what I dig in here? Yep, the 47 nanofarad capacitor. It's sticking with that theme of gray and using the original coincidentally. Two. I must have must be for my other project. I'm just gonna go ahead and have the numbering or the ID facing up, bending the leads, kind of holding that in place. Because of the outline below it, these can be a little bit uh, of a pain when it comes to making everything look nice and neat because that line is meant to be followed, but it's kind of difficult. When you're soldering underneath, you know, you kind of push, pull that solder in place. And lastly, we have 0 0.039. Check that out for our Grateful Dead friends. It's a touch of gray. Let's go ahead and flip this upside down and continuing our soldering journey. Now is a good time to remind you to subscribe and like my YouTube channel or wherever you found this. Please subscribe and like. Oops, forgot. I was watching old NASA how to soldering videos. And they made a really good point. Basically, the soldering should be about just tacking in place a solid mechanical connection. And when you start thinking about that, you, your standards of soldering kind of go up. Because if you have a component that you're just trying to like bridge solder so it holds in place, that's not a good joint. It should be mechanically stable before you do that sort of shenanigans. Okay, at this point, I just need to find that 100 nanofarad MLCC. And here it is. So MLCC, you're going to see here, there's different grades of MLCC. This is C0G, or also known as NPO or NP0. And the reason for the different grades is that this capacitor and why I chose this capacitor and I, I didn't really even care to find out what the original Vemram one is but if I had a choice I chose this one 
And the reason for that is it's very linear. Basically, the, well, the, the performance is stable at different temperatures. So like literally, if you go into a, a cheaper or a less uh, grade capacitor and you put your finger on it like this and raise the temperature of that capacitor, the capacitor is going to change its capacitance. So where that matters, at least in pedals, it's not too bad because you're generally the pedals in room temperature range. But if you're doing an outdoor show and your, your pedal board is exposed in the sun or it's just hot or whatever, guess what? That pedal is going to warm up, especially because I like to choose black pedals, right? Everything I do is just sort of black. Um, it's going to absorb that heat and then your pedal is going to start potentially sounding a little bit different. So that's why I like to choose the very best. And these are automotive grade. So, you know, if it's used in a you know, 200 plus Fahrenheit engine bay and good for that, it must be good for pedals. So that's an advantage of building your own pedals is you get to spec out your own stuff, man. sound like Bart Simpson. Okay. I think that pretty much does it. Oh, no. 47 nanofarad. Why did I forget one? That's what the other one is. Let me go find it. I don't know why it was hiding on me. It's, it's a nice pedal to go in, buddy. Don't be shy. I try to make the look of this pedal look also inside um, as symmetrical as possible. Does it mean more mojo? Eh, not really. But also, I balanced the looks with how long each trace is. Because the lower the amount of trace, the faster your signal. Actually, it's more about capacitance. Um, but your signal is going to go through the circuit with a lot less resistance, I guess, overall. Because um, each trace has its own properties of capacitance and whatever. And you reduce that interference, I guess, by having small traces. Another advantage of these four-layer circuit boards is the signal is inside so you can think about these as like mini coax every single run the way that i designed the circuit board is a, a mini coax connection um so you're going to be in theory the lowest noise traces with a kind of waveguide e all right um all right let's i'll snap in place actually no i'm not up next is wiring for up here and up here. I love, love, love these pre-stripped wires from Stompbox Parts. They're not very like heat friendly, but that's why you work on these skills. So I'm just gonna put a few up here. We're gonna not need that many. We're just gonna go ahead this and do this. So I'm gonna start with the bottom here, and this is another advantage to having this nice silicon mat. I'm gonna feed that through there. I'm gonna feed one through the, so that's output. Feed one through the input. And I give people the option if they wanna do a coax run. That's why I have the ground there. If they wanna run coax anywhere in the circuit. Um, but that's going to and from the switch, so I don't know why you would do that. But if anyone uses this circuit board in a design that runs coax directly to the to the board then that would be an option for them so I don't want to leave that like kind of off the table ah. so this gets a little tricky I'm doing it as many as I am at one point Basically what I'm trying to do is just get the legs to come in. 
and this is extremely to do with a camera in front of my face. So I'm just going to go ahead and tack what I got, what works right now. So that's LED switched all the way to the far right. This is my output. This is my input. All right, let me try to get this LED switch back. go. All right, next up is the ground and the power. So similarly, I'm just going to pull these back like, like that. You can also insert these from the top if you prefer. I like the look of them going through the bottom. Spread it out like that so it kind of holds itself up like a bug. Looks like a bug, doesn't it? All right, now I'm gonna try to reach around my camera and solder. So the nine volt to 18 volt uh, shouldn't be too bad. We are gonna hold it a little bit extra on this ground, remember, because that thing's acting like a heat sink. Hold it, hold it, hold it. All right, that should be good. And it did come through the bottom of the joint, which is excellent. So that is a solid, solid, and it looks worse on camera than it does in real life, as far as the flux. Solid, solid connection. All right, let's open up this potentiometer. It's a bag inside of a bag. All right, bag number one opened, bag number two. Let's open that. Flip the board over, snap it in place. Just double check, should be B10, okay? I think it's also written right here, B10K. These alpha pots are nice. I like the smaller, the shorter ones. Um, I think they look better and more discreet because it's not a primary sort of knob that you would change. I believe this is a saturation. So yeah. All right, next we're gonna grab our pots that we grabbed from Tata. We're gonna grab our enclosure. All right, so we have our pots that we're gonna use. Got them in the Tata order. See, they have the value right here. Um, whoa, where's my camera? Right on them labeled. So that's a plus. Ooh, where are we? We're over here. Come on, guys. It's not going to focus, of course. But anyway, um, we're going to take off because the alphas have these little knobs or these little. They're they're actually meant for when you have a panel or something. You can drill a hole, and then when you tighten down your the pot, it doesn't move. So that's what those little things are for pedal builders. In this case. More of a inconvenience, but they do come off relatively easy. So I'm just grabbing them, twisting them off to the side. Next thing you need to do is identify minimum the ones down here. So the 10K and then the 50K, and we're going to put on the dust cap. So that's not it. Here's a 10K. So we're going to, with that, you know, basically the contour matching the bottom here for an alignment sort of snaps on like that i like to take my pliers in this body part right here on the side and i'll sort of pinch it down in place very carefully not going too heavy but you can see that it's nice it sort of adds a seal for dust to get in the spot but generally this pedal is sealed entirely pretty much anyway. So we got that um, and we need to find the 50K. That's a 10K. Well, the 50K is right here. Go ahead and do the same. All 
So now we're going to grab our pedal enclosure. And there's different ways to do this, but I'm going to just add the 50k for now. So I'm going to double check, always double check. It is a pain to unsolder this afterwards. I'm going to put the 50k in there. And then what is it? The, oh, well, this one, duh, because it's got the thing on it. And you can see what I meant earlier about the back potentially touching. We're going to do this little dance of inserting into these holes temporarily on the top. We're going to do our best to just align with the body here. And very carefully, well, not actually very carefully, you're, you're fine. I'm just going to solder the center leg for now. I find this is the best because the alignment of this snap-in pot with these 16 millimeters can be a pain. Let me tell you, it can be a pain when you flip this around. Come on. Again, another thing that's hard to do while on camera. All right, so now I'm going to grab the other two pots. So 10K, 50K, and they match on the back because I'm ultra paranoid about that sort of stuff because it is so hard to unsolder in the end. And do a similar thing here. The top. Gonna attack and place the middle. And it, like this one's kind of like off to the side. You can kind of notice. You can push it to be more straight. There we go. That's gonna make the install a lot easier. So the last thing we got right now is the LED. So now we're good. We're just using that temporarily to hold those bits in piece in place. We got the LED. And I'm gonna show you a trick. So normally in my other projects, the LED hole goes straight up and down. For whatever reason, at least I was consistent, this one has a little bit of a kink to it, which I didn't know at the time. It's kind of quoting the Rolling Stones. You can't get what you want, but you get what you need. At the time, I didn't realize that that was actually going to be a benefit in the end, because if I have a circuit board that doesn't have an LED or I forgot to put in the LED, it's a lot easier to go in at an angle um, than it is to uh, put it straight in up and down. Like So basically the hole for the LED over here was literally vertical and there's nothing you can do but these square LEDs are awesome see how they're kind of square and I found these after the fact because I guess in retrospect if you use this LED you can come through the bottom actually kind of see here you can go straight through um, but with the traditional like oval LEDs you can't do that so I'm going to look here, see how the long lead is on the right? I'm going to take, I know that these pliers, I'm going to go flush with the body like that. I'm going to bend this way. Okay. So my camera focuses and out. And I'm going to go to the very end there like that. And I'm going to bend up. So now I have that sort of design. The long lead is on the right. Now the bottom of my circuit board, I'm going to feed it through the LED hole. So the long lead is on the right, short lead on it. And then I'm not going to go all the way. I'm just going to go like that far. I'm going to just bend it over. So now that LED is not going to come out <laughs> because I've had it walk away on me. 
I installed the pedal, I soldered everything together, and I realized that the LED was not there. I found it on the floor or somewhere else. All right, now we're going to do the power on this. So, got these, I think these are Lumbergs. like the plastic ones. Out of all of them so far that I've tried, these plastic ones are pretty nice. And be used in many, many pedals. It's a switch um, power, so that means that you could use a battery internally if your pedal was designed for that sort of thing, but mine is not. The main reason why I'm using these instead of, I used to use the small, 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 which are really nice. Um, cables is I started to receive not complaints but customers they were uh, and also I read on the internet that some people were having problems with the center pin actually it was holding in their power supply so well that the center pin came right out um, there was an improvement made by I believe Lumberg uh, themselves they had the same sort of footprint oh, what am I doing here All right, this is a, what is this size? 14 millimeter, by the way. It's the same one I used for my foot switch. Come on, oh, there it goes, it slides right on. I'm gonna kind of hold it in place. The vertical thing is facing down. And that matches my wiring diagram. So if yours rotates a little bit at the very end, make sure you give it some muscle. You can very easily, gently put it back in place like that. Now it looks like this. So again, we're going to have, very important here, pay attention class, this vertical bit is on the bottom, which is going to be our ground, and then at the top is going to be our power input. The middle is not used, that's your switch for batteries and stuff. Okay, let's get our input and output. Well, no, we're not doing that. We're going to grab our foot switch. These are my new favorite switches, and I can only find them from stompboxparts.com. They're very much like the, the kind of turquoise-looking Gorva ones. I hope I pronounced that correctly. But um, these are from Stompbox Parts. It's like kind of their in-house brand. They've advertise it that the epoxy used on the legs is higher temp than the ones the other ones that you find in the market now if you want something a little bit more of a pressure on your foot i highly recommend the alpha and that is like a clunk clunk and some people who play with their foot kind of resting on the stomp switch waiting for that solo opportunity and then they finally engage you're going to feel that better with a alpha. So that is a scenario for an alpha pot or an alpha foot switch. But if you're just someone who kind of comes over, taps and walks away, this might be a better one. Or if you have light feet or like kind of racing shoes, if you're into car racing where you have that very, very thin sole so you can feel your throttle, um, then this might be a better choice. So I'm going to do the bypass switching out of this box. These are zero ohm resistors. They're just, you can buy these on Tata and other places. It's literally just a jumper, but it has sort of the resistant element or the look to it. Some manufacturers use this for jumpers. They're just zero ohms. If you look in a Klon, there is one of these as well. So I'm just going to insert it. And you can just use a standard, like just find a discarded lead. You can see it. All you just need to do is jump the bottom here. Um, I'll zoom in a little bit more to show you what that looks like here while I solder. So at this point, I'm just going to grab my solder. See how I pulled it off to the side. Remember that conversation about mechanical connections being important. This is a good mechanical connection. And I'm going to try to keep this symmetrical. And 
And the high heat epoxy that they chose is specifically for those manufacturers or those pedal builders who use those PCBs on here. Um, those are great. They make wiring a little bit easier, but they're also require like some people are impatient and they just solder, solder, solder away. And that will, uh, or could burn out the internal mechanics of this thing by heating it up too much or that epoxy that you see that black stuff will start melting and that's not good. So I'm going to basically kind of cut this flush. And I'm going to reuse that lead. So hold one to the side, the best straightest one. And this is optional, by the way, you do not need to do this next step is you could take that lead that you just cut whatever the better looking of the two is and feed it through. And if you're lucky, you can get it to go in that other hole up here. And you don't need to go too far, just as long as it comes on through. And don't do anything more once it does. Whoops, see, now I think I wanna go in just a hair more. And if you can, and if you have like a little toothpick, or a dentist tool. You see how I made a little angle there? That's perfect. Actually, I think that might be my best one ever. So we're just going to solder the back one. Do not solder the front. Okay, just like that. All right, just like that. That's exactly what we're going for on this foot switch. All right, for our next trick, we're gonna take our switches and take off all the included hardware <laughs> that you got with them. Um, I like these switches that I got from um, stomp box parts they're really cool and i'll show you what i like about them the most and please don't buy thousands and thousands of them and make it unavailable for me to buy them but you see at the very top here that there's this sort of like a thicker ring i like that and if you look at other switches i don't know if i have one close by uh, here well here's one that rim is bigger. So to compare, when this pops up through, I like the one on the right more than the one on the left. I don't know why. I guess you'll see in a minute, maybe. So I'm just going to flip this over. I like to have the keyhole here facing outward. So I'm going to flip, see that keyhole? I'm going to flip it over and place it through this hole. And I like to have that one also facing the same way. So pay attention. And we're gonna very carefully just take these leads, bend them upwards like that. Okay, and then the back, you can do the same or bend them down like that. So they're kind of coming up. We're going to pay attention to a few different things as we try to bring this into the board or into the enclosure. Make sure that LED is not getting bound up as it's kind of going through. It should be sort of guided to go through the hole. And because of those kinks that we made, it should be a perfect fit like that. And you see here that the switches are coming up through. And then on the back side, so hold it in place. On the back, double check that this, and it is, kind of go, coming through like that. Um, and you can still twist it, okay? Now we're gonna take our faceplate that's a piece of hair on there. We're gonna take our face plate and go over the top. I'm gonna to zoom out a little bit. And at this point, grab a washer for one of them. I like to go in a star pattern. 
and then just kind of finger tight down. And if your pots came like with these um, nuts separately, which I think some of them do, or some of them come on, but I have these nuts, <laughs> these nuts have a flat side and then there's a kind of a rounded side. We want the rounded side to come face upwards. So like this, like that, we're just gonna sort of, just so it holds everything in place for some reason. Well, no, okay, that's finally, you don't wanna cross thread. You definitely do not wanna cross that thread. So just like a lug nut pattern, go opposite corners, opposite corners. And at this point, I'm gonna actually grab, I have a, what is this, a 10 millimeter? Very, very lightly draw that in because now you want to check to make sure your saturation is spinning without too many problems or it's not getting bound up. And because we only soldered the center leg, it should be relatively easy to move things in place so you can get the saturation so it's not binding up. And also take a look, you know, down the shaft, so to say, to make sure that it's not like tilted to one side or the other because maybe, you know, in here, you're not snapped in flush or correct. So that's happened to me before. All right, so that that's pretty free. And sometimes you can look straight up and down and see, oh, hey, I got more wiggle room on the top than I do at the bottom, and this thing's binding up. So let me push this circuit board up, and then that makes it more free. Okay, now I'm going to do the hand tighten a little bit more, like that, like that, like that, and like that. And now let's check. Okay, this time around, the saturation is perfect. I'm happy with like the hand torque that I did here. You kind of want to make sure it's your final torque. So if you want to grab <laughs> your wrench and give it just one more twist, be my guest. But anything more than that, you're going to probably start twisting this pot, believe it or not. And the circuit board should, well, it's designed to be so there's an air gap on the left and then on the right, or the left and then on the right. Um, you can tell that it's a little bit shifted over, but it works. And this kind of fits just right. So I'm not going to try to force it too much over or complain about that. But it is designed. Oh, actually, you know what? That even freed it up even more. So we're good in that department. Um, my LED did get bound up, so I didn't pay attention to too much. Good thing to have on hand always is a dentist tool set. So I got that in the description as well. So I can kind of just very carefully poke that LED through. Um, if anything's out of alignment and my LED doesn't come through, then I need to follow my own instructions. All right, so at this point, let's troubleshoot together. I'm going to loosen this faceplate. So now this faceplate is loose. Now we're going to feed the LED through. Come on. I'm going to line things up. All right, quick TV magic. Of course, the second I stopped recording, I was able to poke that LED through. You can see that it should poke through a little bit. It doesn't. I like to not have it go out too far, but the good thing is that you can poke it through as high as you want for your preference. You can have it crazy high or a little high. What's great about this flat LED, besides it looking amazing, is that it um, has like a 120 degree angle to it. So from any any angle, you're gonna notice that it's on, which is great. Some LEDs are super bright with a very focused area of straight up and down, um, which if you walk over your pedal, you're gonna get blinded basically. And when you come off to the side, you're not gonna notice 
as as easily that it's the pedal is on. So again, that LED really helps align this faceplate. So you can see that's pretty symmetrical. It's actually very symmetrical. I'm going to go ahead and retighten this faceplate down. Again, in a star pattern. Make sure the saturation is free. It's pretty free. It looks like it needs to move over to the left a little bit. So I'm going to kind of wiggle that around. And it's definitely a lot better. Maybe up a little bit. And again, if you had all those pot legs soldered, you would not, that wouldn't budge at all. So we're going to double check again that it's flat. Should be perpendicular to this edge here, not kind of hanging up. At this point, we can go ahead, and I would normally turn on my fume extractor, but I don't have to. Uh, well, actually, I can't on this video. So I'm going to go ahead and start soldering the rest of these legs. You're going to see a bunch of smoke. What's kind of interesting is if you hit the center, again, just with heat, they'll pop. And that just takes the stress out of that leg. <laughs> it's like a massage. Yeah, see, I heard a very gentle pop on that. The ideal scenario is that you don't hear a pop because that means that there's nothing really, there's no tension in that leg. So I think it's pretty aligned in a happy way. This one's going to be a little tricky with the camera in a way, but let's see what we got. So I'm going to come in straight up and down with the solder and, uh, coming in from the left. Just be very careful not to touch that tall one microfarad. Okay, got those in. I'm going to do the switches last in case you're wondering when I'm going to do those. Um, I'm going to double check that the LED didn't come through in a way that I don't like. It seems to be at a pretty good spot at this point. So I'm going to just come in, tack one leg, double check again. It's in the right spot. And I'll tack the other leg. Get that in place. Then I'll take my side cutters. Go ahead and cut them. Just like that. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is see how you can kind of poke this through. I'm just gonna solder or, or put a little bit of solder on the center like that and like that and I'm going to take my finger see that they're at different heights just take my finger and push it through like so as far as it will go not pushing hard just pushing it as tall as I can and that's because I don't want the f your foot accidentally hitting those switches. So that's about as high as I am there. It's going to be out of the way, trust me. That foot switch. Now at this point I'm just going to move these to the side. We're going to add the foot switch hardware, which I will show you the sequence here shortly. This is kind of, I've learned to pay attention to do it this way. So we have our foot switch, and it comes with two nuts, and you definitely want the first nut to go on, because the reason is, if you start, if you just put this through the hole, 
and start really putting, you know, using your wrench or whatever to get, secure that foot, put, foot switch in place, this body is just kind of press fit in with this actuator and you can actually break your foot switch. It will just, it'll just fall right apart. So that's why you use a washer on the very bottom. Okay. And then you're only putting pressure on the threads on this actuator and not on the body, which would separate or potentially separate the body from the actuator. Because I don't know about anyone else out there, but I do CrossFit and I'm really strong. Just kidding. That's very narcissistic of me. Next thing you do, I mean, actually, I do do CrossFit. I just don't <laughs> turn this wrench it's crazy hard I could um, next thing you do is put the lock washer in place and then we're very carefully I'm gonna I like to have see this key and that's sort of how we did it with this um, jumper is facing down so I'm just gonna go ahead like this see make sure that lock washer doesn't walk away on us Gonna go like that. Next thing we're gonna do is get the flat washer. It's kind of hard to do on camera. Put that up here. And then lastly, and that protects the nut from the body of the faceplate. And lastly, we're gonna put the finishing nut on the top. Some people go crazy with finishing nuts. I don't. Some people go nuts for nuts. I think there's other things to worry about. So if you do it right, I didn't come in at an angle to uh, so it slopes down to the right. And then as I put pressure, oops, the other way, and start turning this, the body inside will start turning as well. And that's basically when I have maximum torque, and then it will end up being flush <laughs> in the end if you do it right. You don't want to overdo it and really pull down hard because that would be bad. All right, I'm going to take a quick coffee break and I'll be right back. But you'll know no difference. Wiring up the uh, ground, because I like to do ground bus these things like my guitar amps. So it's going to take a wire. Again, it's the pre-stripped, I think, two and a half inches that I got from Stompbox Parts. You can obviously strip your own wire. Make a nice connection in there. Now what I think I'll do is I'll just wire the back. Make sure you follow along. I have a wiring diagram online. I'm also going to wire it right here. I've been starting to pinch these connections over like this. Makes a nice mechanical bond. Definitely take your time through the section. Pay attention to what you're doing. Because unsoldering foot switches can be a pain. <laughs> so double check everything. All right, next, I'm going to grab this is my pre stripped again, what I'm using. It's a six inch wire. I'm going to run, I'm going to give it a little angle here, like that. Same with this side. I'm going to run it down the side. I'm going to grab it with a needle nose. And feed it up through the center line.
Okay, we have a little dentist tool. Can move it over. Maybe if you get lucky, you can grab it. I'll zoom in. If you don't, that's fine. Just get it up and over and out of the way. All right, next I'm gonna do the same thing. Read this down through the side. I like to go around the LED, but if you're having troubles, it doesn't really make a difference. Let's see if I can grab it. Go. Now, if you did install this wire that goes across, you definitely need to pay attention to these two LED wires. If you did not install the jumper, and this jumper just grounds the input to the circuit when in bypass mode. So some people say that it lowers the noise of the circuit because it's not really active, um, because it's the inputs grounded, so it shouldn't really be doing anything. Um, but for this case, so instead of going kind of like one for one all the way around, we do have to crisscross. And again, this is on my wiring diagram. I'm just going to crisscross like this. Crisscross meaning that the wires aren't going like one for one over here. I can tighten these down. Get out of our way. Okay, so now that those wires are nice and tight. We have to do the top one first. It can float. There we go. And you know what? I just realized that I did not finish soldering my foot switch or these uh, diode clipping switches. This is the next day, by the way, so I might have missed out. Forgot. Again, I usually use a fume extractor, but just for the sake of you guys hearing me, I'm not using it. All right, and at this point, I like to just kind of clean up, make this look nice and neat, how which way I can. It does look nice when it's all tucked in like so. All right, now let's work on the top. I think it makes such a difference in the way that this pedal, or any pedal, feels. It's when you use lock washers on the input and output jacks. Not only does it hold the jack in place, but it also grounds the jack right against the body. 
And when I mean it holds it in place, it kind of creates like a spring sort of action. See this flat side? Have it facing the power. Okay, like that. See how I put also the, the lock washer first? Put it in. Take that. The, the flat washer from the outside. There we go. I'm using this nut driver. I have a dedicated nut driver. Um, half inch. Careful not to scratch the body. See, so it's nice and clean. And another advantage is that with this lock washer is that out here, you don't have a goofy amount of threads. So one thing to pay attention to when you look at other pedal builders out there. See how much threads and how unnecessary that is. At this point, I'm going to take my power and I'm going to give it a kink, like 90 degrees or so, and place it on the top jack or top uh, thing. <laughs> Need my other coffee. So I'm going to try to hold that in place with one finger. Again, this is like 10 times harder to do with a camera in front of my face. All I'm simply trying to do, and maybe I'll just hook it here a little bit more. So get it to hold in place. Okay, so there, I'm going to grab my dentist tool and kind of draw it forward so it makes a connection just like that I need to see the bare wire not the insulation on the top and the bottom because if you put your insulation in the hole you run the chance of not soldering at all, which has happened to me. So I've grown to pay attention to make sure that there's metal or there's wire showing at the very top and the very bottom of a connection like that with a solder leg. And then for this one, again, the flat side pointing towards the power so the flat sides are kind of facing each other. It's just my preference. I'm gonna actually go ahead and tuck this kind of like so. So I'll show you in a second what we're gonna do with that wire that we saved earlier. And tight. You can really also, you know, really tighten that up. Do a CrossFit tight. Okay, so next thing, this the front one's going to be a little tricky. The one on the right. So I'm just going to give it like a bend again, just to give it a little bend. And we're going on the very bottom, the one that's kind of by the jack over here. Okay. Sometimes that other leg gets in the way. But it also holds it in place. Check that out. See how it's kind of holding it? So I'm just going to go ahead and tack it at this point. And then just so it's not, you know, vibrating and, and hitting the other connection, I'm just going to kind of push it down just so it's not, there's nothing... It's not touching. All right, now this one, I'm going to bend inwards 90 degrees, like so. Just 
didn't want it to come out. There we go. All right, now what I'm gonna do, is take my needle nose, and this is optional. I'm gonna take my needle nose and flatten these so they're facing each other, just like that. Now we're gonna take that silver mica leg and you can straighten it. So if you're one for visuals, and feeling good about going the nth degree, I'm going to try to flatten it out as best I can. Take my needle nose, feed it in one way, come back and come through the other leg, like so. Kind of meet in the middle. Tack this in place. So, so this is basically connecting the grounds directly together. There is also a ground connection in theory up here between, you know, that lock washer is biting into the enclosure and onto the sleeve of your jack, which is, you know, this one up here, which is ground. So when you insert it, and you can see how far it goes, it doesn't touch anything. Um, when you insert it, that Ground is also going to be connected directly over there through that body and also directly over here. So if there's any loose connections over here, that ground is still active. Um, some may say that that is a ground loop. I guess it's technically a ground loop, uh, but at such a short distance, should it make a difference? Now with these, I'm just going to simply... Well, I'm going to see which way is the neatest way. I'm going to kind of hold them together. Give it a little vertical fin. Feed it underneath this bus bar and go to one corner. See, the idea behind this bus bar is minimizing the resistance between all these grounds and creating a single ground, a single point of ground. Um, and the reason why I don't spread it out is because it, the closer that these are together, there's no resistance on that wires because resistance on a ground creates noise. So if you ever are like into car audio and you were like me, just piecing stuff together without really knowing what you're doing, and grounding makes a big difference in how much noise <laughs> there is on your amplifier, and you can hear your um, alternator and such. So I like to try to get as close as I can over here, as long as there's no uh, too much pressure, which there usually isn't. But you can see it's all bonded directly to that ground wire. Now, for the op amp, um, I have two choices. I think I have two choices in the bomb. Uh, JRC4558DD, which is the, the higher gain or, or better spec version of the same op amp that's in the Tube Screamer. And also, I would like the 4580 op amp in this pedal. You are free to experiment. Um, I honestly... I've never had a real Janray with me before to really analyze what op amp is being used in it. But I, what I will say is that this particular op amp is phenomenal sounding for this type of circuit. Um, you can go crazy and get kind of like it's, a, uh, well, the TSV-808, the Vemoram Ibanez Tube Screamer. Um, op amp, which is the OPA 2134, which is a great sounding op amp. And all I'm doing here is, by the way, the silicone mat is great, it's flat. I'm just bending one side of the leads a little bit because it will overshoot this, uh, this socket. So I'm going to go in one side, or basically, like the legs will straddle the socket. I'm going to put all of my pins in one side. And then I'm going to do the other side, like so. I'm going to kind of 
put them all in, and then push it down until you hear that little click and it feels nice and secure. Pay attention, make sure that that circle is facing upwards. Otherwise, you may put it in upside down and it will fry that chip, creates lots of crying, and such like that. Right now, at this point, you have a completed pedal if everything goes well. I'm going to install some knobs here. So I'm going to turn all of these down to nothing to the left. And I picked up on Amazon. I really like these knobs, these mini chicken heads. I'm starting to use them. Um, the original design I had use these, which are great, these little cupcake style knobs, but I don't think they really fit. It's all, again, preference, and if you don't like it, then you can change it out, and you can buy a bunch and try and see what you like for yourself. But I feel like these kind of have like a neater sort of thing going on. If you use these, um, you're going to notice that there's some junk in here that they leave behind, which I guess it would just stay in there. But I like to fish it out because I'm a professional. And what's kind of cool about this particular vendor is that they supply the Allen wrench. So instead of seeing like a goofy sort of gold set screw in the back, they're actually nice and black and it requires a hex, uh, one of these Allen wrenches. All right, so now the next thing, because the, it's really tight, that set screw is already sort of drawn or uh, set in there. I'm gonna back it out without taking that set screw out because you might lose it. So as close as you can to the outside, I'm gonna grab our pedal and the alignment on this is pretty dang close to where those white marks are. But what I'm going to do instead, you can see it's really tight, is I'm just going to go a hair above because it's not quite, I've learned, I learned that I didn't do it 100% the same as this pot sort of rotation limits. Okay, so I just needed to back it out even more. So I'm going to lift it up slightly so it's not resting directly against the body. And it's about right there. So let's put the set screw, tight, start tightening it down. It may take a few times here, especially if you're doing this on camera. Here, I'm going to try it this way. All right, now it's it's kind of it's pretty tight. Let me just give it a little, little bit more. Oh, come on. So anyway, start with the bottom. Oh no, look, I overreached. So good thing I <laughs> tested that. If I get lucky, I can, yeah, just spin all the way around. So that way I'm, I know I'm getting close to the very, very bottom. Lift it up slightly carefully as you move it. All right, let's try this again. Need that, that intermission music. All right, finally, that just that way worked better. All right, see, there is the limit. No, no resistance against the, the body. It's nice and smooth all the way around. But you can see, basically, we're going directly on the outside of that dot. I'm going to go ahead and do the rest. 
All right, now um, all the, the knobs are in place. They, they are solid. There's no resistance against the body here. And I love this look. It's kind of futuristic, uh, 50s in a way. Um, when we do the tests, so I want to kind of go over uh, first, definitely, well, first, first, double check all your wiring according to the diagram, proven diagram, uh, over and over. And then the next thing I want you to do is just kind of get an understanding of what we're going to experience when we plug this pedal in. Uh, it's definitely on the lower gain. It's not quite as high uh, volume output or, or boost as its brother, the Vemram uh, TSV-808, or if you bought mine, the ATS. Maybe this is a good time for a plug. This is the brother, the ATS-808, which is a Tube Screamer derivative. Um, this thing is definitely a little huge output. This one is, is a little bit more tame, um, but the volume is going to be uh, a pretty good clean boost-ish gain. As you go up, there's going to be more grit. Now, the gain and the feel of this pedal is going to be directly influenced by these clipping switches. So if you want symmetrical clipping and like kind of a bigger feel to it, less compressed and a little bit less gain, you're going to want this section. And this is going to get a little bit in, into op amp clipping um, in certain frequencies and gain settings. And you're going to flip it to the far right, and then you get more of a higher gain, but a more um, compressed, not sorry, sorry, not higher gain, but more clipping, more, I guess, higher gain. But there's going to be no volume output difference. It's actually going to probably feel like it dropped a bit because you're squashing the signal. And if you want something in between, go ahead and experiment with one to the right, one to the left. Some people might hear a difference if they go the opposite direction. But um, you do have all the options. This normally is an internal dip switch, which is really annoying. Um, the base on this definitely goes up as you go. Saturation and treble are kind of similar. Lower the saturation, and you're going to hear like a little bit more top end sizzle, which is kind of cool if you're going for like the SRV, Steve Ray Vaughan thing. Um, the treble is kind of like a lower frequency in there when it, when you turn that knob, um, but it is extending the treble, more or less. And then I find that when you increase the treble, it sort of interacts with the volume and the gain, so you're going to have to play around. And I think that's why it's so much easier, and I like having the externalized controls, because then I increase the treble and I want to futz around with the gain, or sorry, the, the saturation. Um, to find what I like and then to grab that tiny little screwdriver mounted in the front or wherever it is on the original generator is a pain in the butt. All right, so at this point, you don't need to have the cover on to do your test. Um, as long as when you set this down on your pedal board or wherever your, your station is for testing pedals, um, there's nothing that's going to poke up and touch anything inside. So let's turn this on and see what we got. All right, the moment of truth. Let's see how it is. I got all my controls at noon. Do strum for uh, true bypass. Now let's see what we got. Definitely higher gain. Let's see. Hey, sounds like uh, we're on the right path. So you can do a volume test. Yep, works. Gain. Yep, Kane's working. That's definitely higher. Overdrive sounds. All right, really bad playing while I'm trying to do this with a camera in front of my face. Let's see you treble. You can definitely hear that top end come in. Ooh, spiky, smooth. All right, now saturation, let's turn that down. You can definitely hear the top end again. Kind of like a less throatier, chunkier sound. And now we're going to saturate up. You should hear more of a mid. Kind of like a muffled in a way. 
tone. Let's put that up in the center for now. Now bass. Ooh, I can already tell already. Very bassy. I think it makes the circuit a little bit louder too. Huh? Less bassy, sounds more like my natural spectrum, like that. All right, now with these switches, it's best to hear it when you turn the gain up, just to compensate, I'm gonna put the volume down. Definitely overdrive, let's turn it to the left. A little louder, and I feel a little bit more bounce. And what you're going to listen for also is no popping or clicking. Nothing. No pop, no click. Let's do asymmetrical. Let's do opposite asymmetrical. Full. Most compressed. All right. You have successfully built your very own black triangle overdrive based on a Vemram Jan Ray. Congrats, and subscribe if you like these types of videos.